Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Matt for Remnant TV. We're standing outside the piazza here in St. Peter's Square in Rome, having just finished the Sumorum Pontificum pilgrimage here in Rome. John, Rao, this was an interesting week. I think we learned a few things. Uh, what do you think? Well, we did learn a few things, and I think that what we've learned, perhaps most of most of all, is that this is very much a pontificate in progress. Uh, I cannot say whether we can make any definite comments about it yet. Do you think so? No, I, I really don't. It's been interesting because when we're far away across the pond over in the States, it seems like uh, we hear nothing but the, the very worst news, first of all, or perplexing news about these interviews and so forth. But here in Rome, there's a sense of, uh, you know, this is the way it's always been. There's this, 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 we don't have a saint on the throne, maybe, but then again, there's not always been a saint on the throne of St. Peter. And we're trying to figure out where this man will fit in with the... Uh, with all the popes in history, I guess. Yes, well, uh, again, when I think about this, and certainly what I've heard from a variety of different sources, I think back to those statements about the fact that there are holy popes, there are scholarly popes, and there are political popes, and we seem to be dealing with a political pontificate more than anything else. Yeah, that's right. Now, some things that, that I've heard from people on the ground here have been kind of encouraging. For example, one gentleman here who works in the Vatican was saying that there's never been, in his memory, there's never been a pope over the past two or three pontificates who, who've uh, stressed going to confession more than Pope Francis has. So this is something we certainly have not heard back in the States, and it's a, a tiny glimmer of hope. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, just following up on what you mentioned, uh, it seems to be absolutely the case that this is a pope with a great Marian devotion and a great Eucharistic devotion. The problem seems to be in the incoherence uh, that is coming through, the confusion and the bewilderment that's coming through, which has equally, equally been stressed by people that we've spoken with. Right, right. One thing that I hadn't even thought about, and somebody again here that's living in Rome would know more about what, you know, the, the tenor or the feel of the thing right now, and that is that there were traditionalists in Rome, we were concerned about this back in the States too, who were almost kind of concerned about the fact that this mutual enrichment thing, the, the, the kind of a spin-off of the reform of the reform with respect to the traditional Latin Mass, may have progressed in a direction that would have been problematic for the traditional Latin Mass, but because Pope Francis is really pretty disinterested either in promoting the Latin Mass or in shutting it down, right. that now has changed dramatically, and the traditional Latin Mass is once again in a pretty good position, I think. It seems to be the case from what we've learned that uh, we don't have any worries. Um, uh, what I've gathered is that the Pope has no interest in bothering us. We certainly we heard a message that was delivered to us uh, via the Secretary of State at the Mass on Saturday that indicated that um, the Pope is in no way, in no way concerned for putting obstacles in the path of what we're doing. So I don't think that it would be a wise policy for us to act as though we have an enemy on the throne. There are disturbing things, sure, of course, as sure. well. Well, one thing we can learn from our, our Roman counterparts is that when you're in this town and you have certain, uh, uh, you know, entree, like they had here at the Basilica yesterday, where they were actually able to have the traditional Latin Mass right at the, at the altar of the chair, um, if you become too critical of the way things are going in the pontificate, you're not going to be able to do those things anymore. So they seem to have learned, these Romans, to sort of uh, kind of hedge their bets a little bit so they can maintain the fight, not die on this hill, in other words. So, I mean, in, in a sense, we ourselves also don't want to lose the ground that was gained, especially for the traditional Latin Mass, under the pontificate of Benedict XVI. So we have to be prudent, don't we? And that's not cowardice. That's prudence on, on how best to fight this battle. Yes, this doesn't mean that we have to keep our mouths shut when things happen which are disturbing, or that we have to keep our mouths shut in asking clarifications when there are statements that do seem out of whack with what it is that then is done in way of damage control to control, uh, such as, for example, the, um, the statements that were made in these various interviews. No, it's a, a perplexing situation, to say the least. But then again, we have these historical examples. It's, it's really only the neo-Catholics that have a disembodied papacy that is somehow or other uh, somehow or other conducted through popes that are not flesh and blood human beings. Religious orders, for example, throughout history have had the experiences of having to live through pontificates which are not favorable to them, waiting for pontificates which are very favorable to them. The Jesuits are a perfect example. They come into being, they have um, pon pontificates like that of Pius IV and St. Pius V, which are not favorable to the Jesuits. They then have pontificates such as that of, uh, rather I shouldn't say Pius the, uh, Paul IV, right. and Pius V that are um, uh, unfavorable to them. Then they have pontificates like Gregory the Thirteenth, which are followed by that of Sixtus V, which is not. It's something that people learn to deal with, 
but to deal with without losing their principles. Right. That's right. the point. I think maybe especially for American Catholics, we have this sort of Pollyanna or sugar-coated notion of how it all works. And you either have great saints on the chair of Peter or you have, you know, Alexander the Sixth, who wasn't such a saint. Right. But really, there's always been a pretty predominant human element to the papacy, just as there is to the church. And we have to sort of try to figure out where we are now with Francis. Oh, very, very much so. And we have to remember that popes come to the throne with their own backgrounds. Such as, for example, in the pontificate of John Paul II, it seems very, very clear that he came with a lot of Polish baggage, and I mean Polish baggage from the 19th century, involving romantic nationalist ideas that saw Poland as being the Christ among nations that was going to serve as a means of bringing together in universal brotherhood all peoples. He transmitted that in his own way into his pontificate. This particular pope comes from an Argentinian background, and his own Argentinian background <clears throat> involving his experiences with the Jesuits, that he may want to exercise some damage control mm -hmm. in order to uh, move forward with. And in this regard, I think from what I've gathered, that the interview with La Civiltà Cattolica was something in the way of damage control to make it, uh, make it uh, clear that he does not want to appear to be uh, the um, repressive pope, but the open progressive pope. Right, right. Now, now that comes with, with problems of mm -hmm. its own. For example, just to give you uh, the other side of the picture, today I was talking with Roman friends of mine who were expressing their enthusiasm about the pontificate, and I asked why, and they said, well, because now we know that we don't have to worry about, um, about uh, putting obstacles in the path of divorced and remarried Catholics. And then I asked, didn't you, <laughs> didn't you see that there was, once again, damage control done afterwards? And they didn't know what I was talking about. What yeah. they heard was what they, uh, in the modern context, wanted to hear. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it becomes very clear for us as traditionalists that we have to sort of find our, our niche or find our way. Uh, if we don't have to be critical of the Pope, we will not be critical of the Pope. And when, conversely, when he does something that's good, such as this issue, this idea of pushing the sacrament of confession, we praise him for it and we pray for him at the same time and kind of see how it's all going to work out. This is a church in crisis. This is a world in crisis. Yes. And it's unrealistic to, to, to expect that we're going to have, uh, you know, everything's going to be fine and perfect and clear. It's not clear. It's confused. It's, it's very, very confused. And, of course, one of the aspects of the confusion, which has entered into people's psychology, uh, seems to be this ability to maintain a Catholic faith on one track in your mind, and then the idea that your practical measures for trying to deal with this can be so pluralist in character that they don't take account of the fact that they may be, uh, in many respects, undermining the faith that you do believe in. That's right. Yeah. Uh, how that works out, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But I've, 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 I've felt now, and I know that you've reached the same conclusion, that we're dealing with a difficult situation here that cannot involve us in too provocative an approach towards things. Well, at the same, at the same time, we don't enter into this neo-Catholic praise of every single action. No, that's right. That's right. We're, we're, we're going to have to become better strategists. I better mean, that, strategists. That, that seems to yes. be what it's all about. We just had a chat a few moments ago with Father Lombardi of the yes. Vatican Press Office and uh, asked him if he could give us the statement that came from the Secretary of State to the Samoran Pontifical Pilgrimage Group and Cardinal Hoyos was saying Mass, which was very supportive of the traditionalists in the, the Basilica of St. Peter under the reign of Pope Francis, yes, and uh, so, so little signs like that I think are very encouraging and should be. Well, not only was it very encouraging, but he was clearly, clearly not at all uh, convinced that he had to worry about what he was saying. He just took our, 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 the email address down and then responded favorably yeah. to it all. Yeah. So, so it seems to be the case that we just have to keep our cool. But in keeping our cool, keep our watch as well. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, in the meantime, I, I am so encouraged by the fact, not only by this pilgrimage, which was terrific, but also by the fact that this morning when we were in the Basilica of St. Peter, we saw not one but five traditional Latin masses just going on, and, there, and many more were starting up as we left the Basilica. So there's no sense whatsoever that anything is going to be done to stop the motu proprio or to slow down the traditional mass, the spread of the traditional mass throughout the world or here in Rome. I don't see how we can do anything but take a confidence in that as we go away from the city tomorrow. Yes, and again, direct our attentions nevertheless to fighting this underlying pluralist vision that somehow or other uh, uh, the, the two things are ultimately compatible, the Catholic faith and an openness that um, doesn't expect problems. 
I think that um, whatever happens, uh, it's pretty clear that there are going, once again, to appear problems in an effort to try to seemingly appeal to the world, but nevertheless defend the faith. Yeah. The Pope seems to want to defend the faith, but by the same token, his, his measures that he takes partake of all of the efforts of the past 50 years that are problematic. Yeah, yeah, and I certainly don't want to sugarcoat anything myself either, but we are still in the first seven or eight months yeah. of, of, of the pontificate, and the fact that he's come off as one who sort of can be all things to all men and say good things to Catholics and say very perplexing things to atheists, um, we don't, I'm not saying that that's wonderful and that's fine, but it's possible the man is still trying to find himself too and find out you know, what, what his pontificate is going to look like, what his personality, how his personality is going to affect it. Not unlike, I guess, Marie Antoinette when she, when she comes in as a 15-year-old uh, to, to become Queen of France and she's trying to anticipate what everybody wants and didn't make anybody happy to, 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 that, to speak that, up. That may well be the case. I'm, I'm still myself confused. Uh, the last article I wrote for you, I think I probably tried to... Uh, rationally explain the whole pontificate more than it's capable of being rationally yeah. explained. I, yeah. do, I don't. I don't know if there's a, a poss uh, There's a clear program mm -hmm. yet at all. It's very, very, very bewildering and confusing. And um, I think perhaps what we have to do. I, I'm reminded of my father's comments when he was in the military uh, and uh, was serving as a, an MP, and the traffic became confusing. And he was told as an MP, when the traffic becomes confusing, go off and smoke a cigarette and wait and watch and then see what you have to do to clear things up. It may well be that we have to do the same, but I stress once more, that doesn't mean that we become a cheering squad for things that are done or said like this statement about not judging anyone. That's you right. don't become a cheering squad. That's right. That. That's, That's absurd. Right. It's, it's just a huge blunder. It's, it seems yeah. to us, from you know, looking on as journalists, that it was uh, he's made several blunders in a row. So, but but again, I, I guess I, I guess I would stress with our folks back home is that uh, like, like like the Romans are doing here, they're pushing forward with the agenda for traditional. I'm talking about the traditional, yes. the traditional mass, and they're they're not giving up. They they haven't decided that you know there's no hope, there's no reason to keep on fighting. And as a matter of fact, they're looking for the little scraps of things that he's doing that that they can get behind and support. That's it. That's, That's it. And and in fact from whatever number of different traditionalist sources that we've consulted, we have got the same message. And the same message is that there is no um, blitzkrieg that's being conducted against us. Yeah, yeah. So it's a question of waiting, watching. And uh, I think that's exactly right. That's Still, as, as, to, as hard as this is, as hard as this is, because it is the case that when we hear the things that we've heard, what we want to do is immediately go on a juggernaut. Right, and, right. Um, and I don't know what else to say. That seems to be where we stand. Right I think that's moment. exactly where it is. And as we always conclude these interviews, is that as, as loyal Catholics, you know, sons of the church, we just got to pray for him. And that's not a cliche. That's that's what has that, to happen more than is, anything else. That he is the Pope. We do have to pray for him. And we have to pray for our neo-Catholic brethren that they don't go off the edge the other direction. Yeah, yeah. And just, I, I guess, conversely, that our traditionalists don't start running towards the state of a contest position no, either. No, that's, yeah. that's, that, that's madness lies in that direction. Yeah. Madness lies in that direction. And the two of those extremes meet because they both want a perfect pope that has no human element operative in his pontificate uh, and therefore they have to either praise everything that they do that he does or condemn everything yeah that he does. yeah well maybe we'll come back next year for the for the uh, seventh annual uh, some more pontificum uh, pilgrimage and we'll find out if things are either better or worse maybe they'll be better please god well we'll see we'll yeah. see we just have to wait and see yeah good enough john we'll okay, see you next thank time you. thanks thanks a lot ladies and gentlemen for john rao i'm michael matt for rendon tv and we'll see you next time